the other um, last week. And um, if you've noticed, you see that, uh, um, which I alluded to last week, chapter 11 is connected to chapter 10 and chapter 12 also follows on. So we've been looking at STEAM. You know, we started from chapter 10 by looking at STEAM, types of STEAM, properties of STEAM. We looked at those. And also we looked at the fact that depending on the nature of the STEAM, um, wet STEAM, dry STEAM, saturated STEAM, superheated STEAM, Depending on the nature of the steam, that is what affects the use of the steam. So we saw that and um, our emphasis has been steam as energy carrier, steam as energy carrier, steam as working fluids. And then last week in um, chapter 11, we'll look at how steam, how the um, energy in steam can be measured, how the dryness in steam can be measured. Because in most cases, as we've seen, that is a dry steam that you want. So you don't want, you want to remove as much moisture, even though um, steam is generated from water, but you don't want water in, the, in your working fluid. So you want to remove that. So we looked at how that gets removed last week. And if you remember, we looked at three calorimeters. So we looked at um, we looked at three calorimeters. We looked at the separating calorimeter. We looked at the throttling calorimeter, and then we also looked at the combined calorimeter. So we um, saw three calorimeters. Um, in, in that class. And we also reemphasized um, the need for superheated steam, was, yeah, with superheated steam. So we saw that last week, and then we looked at some calculations. So before we move on to steam boilers, which is the focus for the day, um, does anyone have any question, you know, based on what we did last week that you need clarifications on any question from what we um, from what we did that you need clarification on so please um, you can either you can raise your hand or mute yourself or you type it in in the you type it in in the in the chat panel any question please before we get started All right, so I'm taking that as no questions. Please let's avail ourselves. Let's use, you know, the let's use this opportunity to um, let's, I mean, use the right um, opportunity. Let's do things at the right time. You know, I found it strange. Someone is logged in with my name. I mean, someone's someone is logged in and um, has my name as is or a name or your caller. All right, that is new. Anyway, so we'll get started. So please, as we move on, let's um, um, let's engage. Let's engage. You know, it's of um, it's of no use that I just keep teaching, and um, you you're hearing, but in terms of understanding, that is not happening. So yeah, so those are the things we saw uh, from the previous weeks. So I've just done a quick recap. So today we'll be looking at boilers so that's what we'll be looking at today boilers and when you i mean from the name already you can know um, you know the implication of that we i know we all have um kettles you know we have different we have all our kettles which act as boilers at home but in this particular case we'll be, we are looking at boilers you know to generate steam you know, steam that is used for power generation, steam that is used to drive engines. So that's what we're looking at. So the first type of boiler that we'll be considering today, and also from the names, I said, you're looking at two boilers. Some of the things I want you to take note is from the names, excuse me, of the two boilers, you can also have an idea of how they work. 
because the emphasis for us would be how do these boilers work? How do they work? How are they put into use in the industry or wherever else they are used? So from the name, we might be able to, we should be able to pick up that. So the very first one is called fire tube boiler, fire tube boiler or shell type boiler. I want us to focus on the fire tube part, the, I mean, the, 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 the name fire tube. So from the name, we can, um, so and all, we can pick two things. The first part is fire and the second part is tube. So the way this boiler works is that you've got a tank and inside the tank, there are tubes. So if you look at the picture you have here, so if you look at this picture um, here, let me just get my arrow Yeah. So if you look at the picture here, you see that you've got a tank. So that is the tank. And then um, let me also get yeah, my, okay, so you've got, so you've got, this is a tank and through the seal, so take note the tank or a drum and this tank as um, is sealed, but within the seal tank, we now have what we call tube. So you see, this is a tube, that is a tube. So we have different tubes through the tank. So you have different tubes through the tank. And so that's the, so that's where the tube name comes from. And now the third, the second part of the name, fire, where does that come from? So we have what we call a furnace. So here is the furnace. And so remember we've said we've got tubes in the boiler or in the drum. So we have tubes through the sealed boiler, through the drum, and these tubes are surrounded by water. Take no, note of that. I'm emphasizing those because in the next, um, in the next type of um, boiler, we are going to see a, a flip. We are going to see something different. So we've got a furnace. So the furnace is where the heat is generated. So when the heat is generated in the furnace, there is a release of what we call flu gases or exhaust gases there. So there is a release of what you call flu gases or exhaust gases. So obviously these gases, they carry heat in them. So these heat carriers now go from the furnace into the tube. So as the heat, so the tube, um, so as the um, heat being carried by the exhaust, gases as they go through the tube the water surrounding the tubes are heat and is heated so the water within the drum so the water is heated and as the water is heated steam is formed let me just go over that again so we said it's called fire tube so the tube part the name comes from the fact that you have tubes inside a boiler or inside a drum or inside a sealed tank. So those tubes are surrounded by water. So the tubes are surrounded by water in a sealed tank. And then connected to the tube is a furnace where heat is generated by the combustion of a fuel. In this part, in many cases, in most cases, the fuel that is combusted is coal. So we have our coal being combusted there. So as the coal is being combusted, we have flu gases that are released or exhaust gases. These flu gases go through the tubes carrying heat. So as they go through the tubes carrying heat, the water surrounding the, water surrounding the, the tubes are, is heated. And as the water is heated, uh, as the water is heated, steam is generated. So that is um, the description in a nutshell. I've, um, captured, I've captured that better in the, on the blue box here. So that is how it works. And is the jet most common type of industrial boiler. Um, three of us use this, I've indicated them there. Your locomotive engine, you know, your train, um, the old, especially the, the old train, the trains that use, um, that use coal so that, that, that your steam locomotives 
and small installations, we mostly don't have that here in South Africa. But if you go in the Western world, you know, where they have central heating system, so where they have something like um, a radiator, they have a radiator in the house um, installed on the wall. So they usually have those, you know, to heat up the buildings. And also, um, you also have installations for factory processes. Any question as we move on? Questions? Okay, I don't see any yet in the panel. So please, um, I keep emphasizing, if you have any question, don't let it stay for too long. Um, don't hesitate, raise your hand or type it out. Raise your hand or type it out in the chat panel. So that is how um, that works. So the next one is called water tube boilers. So from the name, from what we saw in the previous one, I've explained why the previous one is called um, fire tube. So what do you think would happen in this particular case? Any, any takers? So we've said in the previous one, the tubes are surrounded by water and it's called fire tube because, um, because exhaust gases coming from the furnace, the fire goes through the tube. So what, how do you think this would work? Any takers? How do you think you know, this particular one works? How do you think this particular one works? Any takers? So we've seen flow gases in the previous one go through the tube. The tubes are surrounded by water in the previous one. So are any, any takers from the description of the previous one and seeing, like I mentioned earlier, that the second one is a direct flip. It's a newer version. It's a more uh, innovative version of the previous one. So, what do you? How do you think this works? Any takers in the class? Okay, I don't see any comments. So, this one works, you know, um, like um, direct opposite. So, remember the previous one. I mentioned the fact that the water surrounds the tube. But and the and the flow gases go through the tubes. In this particular case, the water is inside the tubes. So the water is inside the tubes, and then the water inside the tubes are uh, the water inside the tubes is heated by the fire from the furnace, and as that happens, steam is generated. So based on the based on this fact, a couple of differences. So we've seen the very obvious difference that in the second, in the case of the second type of boiler, water goes through the tube. The second difference is the fact that this particular boiler is able to, to withstand high pressure. So please take note of that. It's able to withstand high pressure. Another thing it's able to do is it's able to produce superheated steam. So because of the high pressure, it's able to produce superheated steam. And another um, difference that I'm going to, I'll try to, um, that I'll highlight is that it also provides a larger surface area for the steam and for the, for the steam and for the heat. To, to, to go through, I mean, for the heat of, um, around the steam. So please take note of that. So let me go over that again. The fact that in this particular case, the tubes contain water. In the previous case, these tubes are surrounded by water in the tank. But in this case, the tubes carry the water and the water in this tube is heated by the fire from the furnace. How is the fire, <coughs> excuse me, from the furnace generated? <coughs> excuse me. How is the fire from the furnace generated? A fuel is combusted. And I've mentioned 
in uh, in most cases is coal coal that we use for this so the fuel combust heat is generated and the steam is generated so please take note of that so i've tried um so what i did is provided two diagrams so that you'll be able to appreciate this better so i've um in the first diagram, um, a simplified one. So um, I've made as so a simplified one. So you have the furnace here, where the coal. I mean, there you see where the coal is being combusted, and um, as the coal is uh, coal is being combusted, the flue gases are heating up the tubes. They are eat, the flue gases are eating up the tubes, and inside the tubes you can see there is water inside the tubes and this water gets boiled and it's converted into the steam. And it's this steam that is used for the different processes as the working fluid. And these are some of the processes, um, the refining units, this will be in your petroleum industry. So in, in your petroleum industry, and this is also in your power generation. So for example, when you hear about, um, um, the different uh, power plants, um, they talk about your coal um, being used, um, there's an issue with the Medupi power plant and things like that. So these are some of the things that are occurring there. So it's able to withstand higher pressures and temperatures. Superheated steam is generated as I mentioned. All right, moving on. So we'll look at um, three comp three things, we call them auxiliaries. What's the meaning of auxiliary? Any taker in the class? Two questions um, I, want to, uh, I want to ask. One, when you hear the word auxiliary, what does it mean? And two, what um, I've highlighted four auxiliaries here. Um, actually, um, four auxiliaries, what do you think um, their functions are? Any takers? Please, I like us to. Um, I want us to engage with this. Don't let it be a monologue where I'm just the only. I'm just speaking. You're just listening. I want us to um, engage with this. So, one, when you hear the word auxiliary, what does it mean? Two, what do you think the um, thank you of a king, Maleka? Uh, thank you. Additional support help. So it means that the thing, the, the system can work. So that's the meaning of, of, of auxiliary, additional support. So, um, so if it's an additional support and help, so what does that, what, 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 I mean, what would be the, fun, the general function? The general function would be to enhance the efficiency. So it means that your, um, your boilers will work. Um, your boilers will work. So actually, so if we are to look at the, the four things that I've stated here, we should actually say that economizer, super eater, and here preheater pre should be the main, um, or should be the auxiliaries because boiler is the major component. So as Overkeng said, those are additional support. So it means your boilers can function without them, but the efficiency will be lower without them. So we want to increase the efficiency one, two, or improve the efficiency two. We also want to reduce the cost. We want to reduce the cost. So those are the reasons why we use the auxiliary. So I haven't said that. Any, um, any takers, what do you think the functions of, so let's leave boiler out of it. The three others, what do you think their functions are? Economize, economizer, superheater, we've, um, we've talked over and over regarding superheated steam, hair preheater. So what do you think their functions are? Thank you, you're, you're spot on. Um, let's contribute, don't let, don't let it be overcame only. Let's um, also, let's engage. Economizer to reduce energy consumption, spot on. Any other takers? Please, if you want to use the mic as well, don't hesitate to unmute yourself. Any other takers? 
I thought um, the superheater should be the should be an obvious one from based on what we've seen in previous classes. I don't see any hand up. I don't see anyone unmuting. Any anyone um, who wants to respond? Okay. Also right. So superheater converts saturated steam. So um, when um, you remember when the water is being heated, the water you generate is saturated. And we've said that oftentimes you're saturated or wet steam, you know, they are going to cause fouling. They are going to cause um, rust. They are going to cause things that we don't want. So you want dry steam. So spot on. Here, um, air pre preheater, any other taker? When we do this, when we engage, we tend to remember better. Thank you, Grant. Is to eat the air before another process. So, what would that another process be? So, the preheater will eat the will um, yeah will increase the temperature. So, oftentimes, I always advise you know when you're defining something, don't use the same word from yeah. Thank you. Don't use the same word as contained in, in, the, in the thing. So the preheater will increase the temperature of the air before another process. So you're spot on, um, um, Grant. So let's move on. So thank you for those contributions. So let's move on. So those are the, you've um, described them. So let's just look at them in clearer details. So we've described what um, auxiliaries are, I've, we've described them, and then their main functions as from the um, looking at it, heat recovery. Mm -hmm. So the main function is when you talk about heat recovery, you're saying that you don't want to lose some heat. You know, think about it, when you use your kettle, for example, when you use your kettle, for example, you want all the, um, you want all the, um, temperate, you want um, the heat to be generated inside the kettle, right? But if you are to touch, if you are to, obviously you don't want to do that. If you are to touch the kettle, you see that the kettle itself is losing some heat into the atmosphere. So that is some loss. So it means that the heat going outside from the walls of the kettle, from the outer walls of the kettle can actually be trapped and be used for something else. So it can be used for something else. So that's what we call heat recovery. So within the boiler, so heat from the boiler, heat coming from outside the boiler can be recovered. And we usually do that from what we call heat exchangers. So your economizer is an heat exchanger. So heat exchanger from, so what it does is, so your heat exchanger, you see that as you move on. So um, you're going to learn that I believe in CET, in design and other subjects, which you see in um, subsequent years. So your heat exchanger, so what you have is, so you have temperature coming in from one side, it takes the heat and it, um, it, uh, it transfers the temperature to another device. <coughs> Excuse me. So economizer, so as I've said, it's an heat exchange device. So what it does is heat from exhaust or flue gas. Remember I mentioned earlier on using your care tool as an example. So the heat that, should, that could have been lost, that should have been lost will be trapped, will be taken up by the economizer and these can be used in boiling the tubes, in boiling the tube. So by doing that, you increase, so you, you, that it is used for the tube, you increase the temperature of the, you increase the temperature of the, of the water. So what that happened, so what happens is as um, one of your colleagues, as um, I, yeah, Grant mentioned earlier on. So what that happens is that you will need less heat from the combustion. So you are going to need less heat from the combustion. So that is where the name comes in. So if you, if you need less heat from the combustion, what does that tell you? 
we, we are going to um, consume less fuel. If you are consuming less fuel, it also goes to the fact that we spend less money on that. So that is why it is it's, it's called economizer. So you, you are economizing in terms of the fuel being used. So and, um, inherently, indirectly, you in, or inherent, inherently, you're economizing the cost as well. And then we have the boiler. Um, I don't, I'm not going to um, overshoot, um, overshoot that. And then you have what we call superheater. We've talked about that. So you want to do that at a constant, you want to increase the temperature for that. And also you want to ensure that you have a dry um, steam. Let me just pause there before we move on to the air preheater. From what I just mentioned and from what we saw last week, what other auxiliary, um, let me use general word now, the, all the auxiliaries we mentioned here, the four, uh, the four or the three main auxiliaries that we mentioned here are heat recovery auxiliary. If we were to say generally auxiliaries in a boiler, and from what we've learned from previous weeks, what other auxiliary do you think would be useful? From what we've learned from previous week, especially from last week, what other auxiliary, especially when it comes to generating a useful um, steam, you want to generate a superheated steam, what other auxiliary do you think will be useful? Any takers? From what we saw last week. It, it's not going to, um, it's, not, uh, it's not a heat recovery um, device, but it will be useful for your superheated steam. What auxiliary do you think that it will be? Okay, um, no takers, that would be your separator. Your, you remember we saw separating um, calorimeter last week. And what does it do? Your separating calorimeter dries. It removes water, it removes wetness from the steam. So a, a superheater will be um, useful here as well. A superheater will be useful um, here. So, I mean, sorry. Uh, um, uh, a separator will be useful here in connection to the superheater just to, re to remove the wetness. And then we've talked about the air pre um, preheater. Another thing I want to take note of is this. Let me just bring that out. So I want to take note of their placement after the economizer. So those are things I want, other things I want to take note after the economizer, take note of this as well place between the boiler and the chimney. So two things we want to take note for each of them. One, their functions. Two, their positioning. So in the system, so their function and their positioning within the system. So those are the things you want to take note from, from here. Any takers before we move on to um, another aspect, um, the following aspects have to do with um, um, where we'll be looking at more calculations. Any, any, any question? And before I move on, um, lest I forget, uh, I'd like to know, any, um, are those anyone offering APTS? Remember I mentioned in the first class, because I expect those who are taking the APTS subject from the previous years. They are supposed to be in the CTHS class as well, this class. Is anyone in class today? Um, can you indicate if you're in class, you, um, you're taking APTS and you're in class today? Any, any, anyone taking APTS? The old um, curriculum, from the old curriculum, from the old previous ND the previous national diploma. Okay, um, should I take that as a no? There's none of them in class. Okay, all right. Because I've sent 
several announcements to that effect that they are supposed to start coming to class. I sent from last semester and I've also sent at the beginning of this semester and two weeks are gone already. Okay, so please, in case you know any of them or um, in case you're in class and you don't want to um, mention here, please send me a, a message later on. All right, so um, I'll move on. A couple of calculations we'll be looking at here. The first one is what we call evaporative capacity, EC. So remember, um, as we typically do for um, the lectures, we start by emphasizing on the theory, and then we move on to, uh, we start by emphasizing on the theory, and then we look at the calculations. Um, I've posted the calculations for you as well. I'd like you to engage with that after this synchronous class. But um, while we are here, let's talk about some more theory. So it can be expressed. So um, th those are the, so take note of the unit. So even from the unit, you'll be able to pick the definition. From the unit, you'll be able to pick the definition. And the general definition is the quantity of water. So you see that from here, the quantity of water at 100 degrees centigrade that a boiler can convert into dry or saturated steam at 100 degrees C from each kilojoules of energy. So you can see that from there. So from the unit, sorry, from, from um, here rather, kilogram of fuel. So from the unit already, you can see the definition. But the definition is incomplete without these two words. I mean, without this, 100 degrees C. And you can see it's mentioned twice. The reason why it's mentioned twice is because of this, from and at. So from and at. So that's why, um, so that's why um, the, the, you see 100 degrees C is mentioned twice. I've broken it down in these other definitions. So um, I don't need to read those again. So I've broken it down into in that definition. So take note of that, steam. And so we'll see why are we mentioning steam, 100 degree centigrade. So that's why we are mentioning that. And remember your steam starts getting, except for your superheated steam that can be generated at higher pressure. You can have um, all the steam at higher pressure. We've seen that earlier on. And why do we have, um, so that is what your evaporated um, capacity is about. But I want to take note of something that beyond the evaporated capacity, we also have what we call EEC, equivalent evaporated capacity. So take note so that in case as you move on, I just keep mentioning EEC. So that is your EEC, equivalent evaporated capacity. And why do we use this? We use um, EEC because um, of varying um, conditions. I'm going to also mention in the next slide why we use EEC. So we use EEC um, be, um, when we are looking at different boilers using the same fuel, but operating, so they use them. Um, so let's, we, okay, let me get my pen again. So if the boiler is using the same fuel, um, but the, uh, but the uh, what do you call it? The steam generation, the conditions are different. For example, the temperature might be different. So take note of that. Um, so I've mentioned, um, let me get the pen again. So the operating conditions might be different, but if the fuel is the same, so take note of that. Um, let me get the pen again. Same fuel, but different conditions. Same fuel, but different conditions. So when you have the same fuel, when you have um, different boilers uh, using the same fuel, but different conditions, we'll see that in a more clearly 
in our calculations. So same for different conditions. For example, in one boiler, you might have superheating taking place. In another boiler, you might not have superheating taking place. But those two boilers are using coal. And then, so that, that's when you use EEC. So take note of that. So when you're comparing the, um, the efficiency of your boilers, we use EEC, efficiency of your boilers that are using the same fuel but different operating conditions. That is when we use EEC. I'm emphasizing that because you're going to see something different in the next slide. And take note of the calculations. I mean, of, of this, um, we'll see that in the calculation. So we know uh, MS is the mass of the steam, MF mass of the fuel. And remember, I also alluded to that earlier on, also um, looking at the um, uh, looking at the the unit. And then we have the change in enthalpy, and we have um, the the other. We have this value there. So please take note of that. So in the next, so um, the other way, the efficiency can be compared between boilers is what we call thermal efficiency. We've seen this before in, uh, in previous classes last semester. So when do we use thermal efficiency? We use thermal efficiency when the foils are different. So for example, boiler one, boiler A is using coal while boiler B is using petrol or kerosene, paraffin or diesel. So when that happens, you compare the efficiency by using thermal efficiency. So take note of that. So we use that and then the rest are your equations I've indicated. So the rest are your equations and then I've emphasized the, um, the differences. So take note of that. The final thing that I want to emphasize here, which I alluded to earlier on, is the fact that your boiler is a sealed container, but we still have some heat being lost from the walls. We have it being lost from the walls. We have it being lost from the different components, from the economizer, Take note that um, the ever sometimes you see the word evaporator, that's the same word. So take note of that. Let me go back to where we described it. Your evapor um, your evaporator is also your boiler drum. So take note of that. So in case you see that being used interchangeably, so that is also your evaporator. So your evaporator. So that is your boiler drum. So please take note of that in case you're wondering what's the difference. So you can have those different losses. So um, we, we often measure those losses. We account for those losses. And why do you want to do that? We do that so as to try to work on the efficiency of the system. So you want to work on the efficiency of the, of the system. You want to see, uh, instead of wasting the heat, can we get in um, each exchanger to get the heat, heat trap and have it channeled elsewhere so that you don't lose the heat? If you look at what we have here, for example, 100% goes in and it's only about 74% that is generated. Every other thing is lost. Every other thing is lost. But when we carry out a heat balance, this loss can be converted into gain using, so this hot loss can be converted into gain by using appropriate measures. For example, your heat exchanger. So you can put your heat exchanger there or you can put uh, insulators where appropriate. So let me, so heat exchanger, you can put install heat exchanger. You can also install insulators. We are appropriate. So the other things are um, calculations. So please, have the as usual, I've done a PDF. Um, I've done a PDF solution for the calculations, which I want you to look at in the next um, 
in the next session as um I've, as I've, as I've, um as we agreed in the previous classes remember uh, in the previous class rather we said i'm going to use the first two uh, we use the first early sessions for synchronous classes like this and then you're going to use um all the, the later sessions you know um using the body system using the um using the body system using um uh, what um using class discussion so i'm going to pause here and then i want us to um go back to our different groups i want us to discuss this i want you to look at the materials that are provided online i want you to send me questions so i'm available for the rest of the day, I mean, up until four, four o'clock, let, oh, let me extend it to 4.30 today. If you have any question, you can send me uh, a direct message on, on WhatsApp. So if you have any question, please do that. But like I've mentioned, it's always um, use the body system, use the